So I, I, I thought I'd take a half hour here to um, tell you a little bit about what my views are and what I think is happening in the uh, world of large-scale I.O., particularly for scientific computing. Uh, th there are going to be really quite a large number of changes largely forced on us by changes in the hardware, yeah? but they have implications for what will work in software and what won't. Um, so here are roughly the uh, things I want to cover. Uh, I kept the section about obstacles very short because uh, you would almost get tears in your eyes about the obstacles. And so the, uh, but, but on the other hand, obstacles are very important. So to start with the real tears, let me put this slide up. Um, this is, you know, um, one of the best Macs you can buy, and you get 3% I.O. efficiency on copying a file on an idle machine. This is our problem, yeah? Uh, I.O. is not 90% of the available hardware bandwidth. I.O. is just like computational efficiency for forecasting the weather, 1%, yeah? And you can be a little bit luckier, you can be less lucky than that, and uh, it's a major challenge to overcome this. Now, another problem that uh, doesn't help us very much is this one. Uh, my system is always the very best. It's 10 times faster than all other systems. Yeah, I don't tell you how to reproduce my results. We don't understand why it is faster, and there's usually no code. Yeah, this is um, really a pity. And uh, scientifically, it would almost be called a fraud. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a, a very sad situation. Uh, of course, I'm guilty myself, uh, but I see many people smiling, and I think they might secretly also be guilty uh, of these kind of graphs. Yeah? Um, I hope I made the graph sufficiently anonymous that the culprit is uh, unknown. Yeah? Um, um, so I think that uh, these are the two challenges. Namely, uh, the story is very difficult to get good I.O. efficiency, and uh, the work methods need a lot of improvement. I, th that's more a problem than anything else. Um, so I started my uh, I.O. career in a somewhat chaotic way. Um, I was cornered in the elevator by Seagate in uh, 1998, and they asked me, uh, would you please tell us how to build a cluster file system? And I said, well, I know nothing about cluster file systems, so I'll send you a friend who knows about cluster file systems to talk with you. Um, the friend went traveling, and so I, I jumped in. I first went to the library for three days to learn what cluster file systems really were, and I was clever enough to register the domain name luster.org, uh, which still exists, and uh, I, then I, I, I told Seagate, this is an idea, but I don't really know how to do it. I also told the Department of Energy, I don't really know how to do it, but uh, despite all that, they let me try. And so we, we got cluster file systems, um, a, a lot of different cluster file systems in roughly 2000. Uh, there were at uh, Compaq and Hewlett Packard alone, something like six or seven competing cluster file systems. Uh, this has narrowed down. Now, what did these things actually do for us? They, they did deliver a few very important things. The first, these were the first networked file systems that involved a lot of servers. So um, not one file server, but maybe 10 or so, and many drives. Um, also, Unlike uh, NFS and AFS, this system had very precise, most of these systems have very precise POSIX semantics. Um, POSIX is the wrong API for distributed computing, but at least it's a well-defined API. A lot of problems arise from systems that are built without APIs, and I will come back to that because this keeps on following us that there are no standards and we are trying to build things. Uh, also, many cluster file systems were able to uh, achieve quite a high percentage of the hardware bandwidth in optimal circumstances, yeah, not uh, in the reality as we've already seen. But there were several problems that remained, and perhaps the first one is that, in general, the performance remained very poor. Um, the performance remained poor, first of all, perhaps because a 
use case in scientific computing is very different from a general data center. A job will want a very significant amount of resources from the storage system all at the same time. If you slow one thing down, the whole thing will follow with the, with the same slowdown. Yeah, and these reservations of resources, I believe, are still a problem. Yeah, they, they are not really resolved. There are some quality uh, of service guarantees now, uh, of service guarantees, but they're not very strong. The second thing that we discovered is that things like RAID and striping and having multiple processes are really a mixed blessing. The moment that two processes start writing to the same stripe, or that multiple servers are dealing with one client or multiple clients with one servers, all the optimal scenarios go away. This problem was very successfully resolved. Uh, a system called ADIAS was written in, uh, later in, in the 2000s. And uh, the differences are shown on the graph at the right bottom. Uh, you know, they sweep the floor with untuned applications. I will tell you a little bit more about ADIOS in a minute. Uh, the other problem uh, that remains is that there are very complicated interactions between metadata and data that affect the I.O. tremendously. For example, updating the file size or the access time is uh, often disastrous for performance. So these were problems not solved by cluster file systems at all. So as an aside, what does ADIOS really do? It makes, first of all, a very important functional distinction between what needs to be written and how do we write it. And for the, the semantic behavior, what needs to be written, it introduces a new API that has, is, is a little different from the POSIX API, but very, very sensible. It says, here's a group of processes this is how many elements they need to write. And, uh, and uh, then it does the I.O. asynchronously. So it, it buffers it until the system can organize that the I.O. goes in a coordinated fashion. It can be aggregated, and, and lots of nice features exist. Separately, it specifies how it will be written. What is the right disk layout? Which servers to use? What stripe sizes? And that sort of thing and uh, maybe what drivers to use. And it has an external XML file to determine that. So this separation, I think, has been very, very helpful. And uh, the, ideals, uh, the, uh, the ideas behind ADIOS, could you say that backwards four times for me, please? Yeah, yeah. The, um, yeah uh, the ideas behind ADIOS are uh, living on today in uh, systems like HDF5 and, and probably many other systems have, have learned from this. So the second thing that was discovered is that uh, writing to unstructured POSIX files is not so convenient. Yeah, so support for structured data is very helpful, also for scientific applications. And HDF5, I think, is uh, really emerging as the winning standard here. Um, it started with uh, you know, lots of one- and multi-dimensional array structures to store them easily. It added trees and key value stores, and, and there is always something new. Um, it has a surprisingly small overlap with similar custom data formats in the cloud. This is something that I don't really understand why th these two systems haven't uh, get any closer, but maybe they will in the future. Um, other formats are beginning to rely on HDF5. I think that maybe five or 10 years ago, HDF5 was one of many. Now HDF5 looks to be leading the pack, uh, and that is, that is good. The implementation framework is now quite rich. There are things like drivers, lots of utilities for visualization. There was a beautiful uh, co course here yesterday to show you uh, how to do some of these things. There are also some things still to be desired. Nicely integrated, easy to use HDF5 solutions, yeah, aren't really sold yet. There is the obvious layering to run it on top of a file system and in the future on object stores, that is, uh, that's just beginning. Uh, but uh, I, I think some more integration is needed and we will get back to that um, in, in a few minutes. Uh, there are lots of I.O. libraries. Um, this is an overview that Oak Ridge made. Uh, Oak Ridge is the maintainer of ADIAS, so they're probably slightly biased towards ADIAS, but um, uh, it, it also isn't a comprehensive 
uh, slide with features. Uh, but uh, as you can see, lots, lots of good things here um, and lots of choice. Let's move on. Yeah, this is what happened with file systems and right afterwards. Yeah, so I said they brought some structure, they brought large scale installations with many servers, but the performance remains problematic and formatted structures, formatted data remains problematic. Um, elsewhere in the industry, object stores became very popular. So object stores were earlier used inside file systems, but not really taken outside with good APIs and that sort of thing. Luster and uh, the Panastas file system, for example, have, have object stores behind them. Um, object stores um, brought uh, completely new things to the world. They uh, are very, very scalable. So they don't have a file system namespace. Uh, there's basically an almost flat namespace. An object has a name and that's it. Uh, the data management we've seen with object st stores is fantastic. What you can do in terms of replication and availability is orders of magnitude better than what file systems have offered. And uh, as a result, probably most web applications actually run on the object stores in Amazon, yeah, the S3 object store. So it's, it's been um, very, very successful. Object stores tend to run well on the cheapest hardware. So cluster file systems have generally used a somewhat higher grade of disks and, and RAID controllers and those kind of things. Object stores had no need for that. They can run on, on very low cost hardware. But um, a blessing as it may be to not have a namespace because it's very scalable, people do want to organize all these objects and the lack of a namespace is a problem. Yeah. Um, another thing is that the APIs have several issues. So you can usually write an object only one time from the beginning to the end. Yeah. If you're lucky, you can append to it. So that's the next thing you can do. You can't write in the middle of an object, typically. Yeah. The, it, it is only made to write a whole object out. That is very inconvenient. Yeah particularly if you have multiple nodes, each contributing to a larger data set, you would want to be able to deposit bits and pieces of these objects and you can't. So the APIs, loved as they are for their simplicity, they're not really right for scientific computing, I think. The performance tends to be disappointing, um, so you don't get um, high bandwidth to objects like you can do to a cluster file system, but that is to some degree somewhat made up for by uh, the scalability. Yeah, you can maybe just use more servers and that sort of thing. Um, by the way, Dropbox is built with objects. For the longest time, they ran on Amazon S3 objects. And uh, they had bazillions of objects. Every four megabytes in a file or so became a separate object uh, in Amazon. Yeah, so it, it, it is definitely possible to build very, very good systems uh, with it. A, a general problem that is, is the last one on this slide. When you build a new storage system, you would like to use components like this, yeah? And uh, very commonly, a new storage system would use an existing disk file system or try to use an object store or a metadata uh, store or a database. And it has been quite difficult to reuse object stores inside like new file systems or other new storage systems. Yeah, and this brings up this whole question whether the ecosystem of storage software is healthy for reuse. Um, the market is certainly very healthy. Look at how many there are, um, and, and th th there are probably at least two or three more, times more than these, yeah? So th there are probably 30 or so object stores. These companies get acquired sometimes, and so it's a hot topic. Um, but in scientific computing, an alternative is being asked, like, do we really need these object stores or could we perhaps just write files in ZFS file systems? Yeah, And could we uh, do that and then keep our normal read and write I.O. operations instead of the put and get operations? Um, hierarchical redundancy is something that uh, all the big cloud companies have got right, but you can't buy it, I think. 
And the sort of redundancy of data that you want is you want some redundancy inside a box. Yeah, what was previously offered by RAID, um, some kind of erasure code. Then inside a rack, you may lose one unit. It would be best if you can replace and rebuild that unit inside the rack without having cross-rack communication. So that's the second tier of redundancy. And then the third tier would be between the racks. Yeah, and this is an adequate amount of data protection. And um, I, I know that Los Alamos is trying to, um, to implement this using existing ZFS file systems and relatively simple mechanisms. Now, another important thing is that scientific computing needs a form of transaction. You have to sort of agree between all the nodes that something is complete. It doesn't have to be an asset transaction or something like that, but you have to say this phase of the computation is done. Yeah, we must have that on disk. So that needs to be built in. It's not an easy problem. Now we're beginning to look at, at the newer technologies. Um, so there is a wilderness of new memory technologies coming out right now, and they place a, a, a high demand on the software. So in the uh, diagram at the, at the top, I, I'm going from a CPU package on the left to the memory units on the system, the DIMMs that might be there. There might be flash storage in between, and finally we hit disks somewhere. Yeah, there will be different kinds of interconnects between these units, and the newer parts of this hierarchy are, first of all, the high bandwidth memory that you find in the packages now. Yeah, it, its bandwidth is approaching a terabyte per second, uh, so it's 10 times more uh, than what was available with RAM. The next new thing is NVRAM units. Uh, so Crosspoint is maybe the first one to, to ship from Intel. Uh, it has roughly the same bandwidth as RAM has. Um, and uh, then Flash has been there now for a few years and, and Disk has been there for a longer time. So here you see roughly what a per node picture of bandwidth can look like. Yeah, if you build a reasonable computer, with, uh, the, you, you get these sort of numbers. So, very roughly speaking, this goes down an order of magnitude for each tier. Yeah, that is a bit of a problem because that means that if you move data here, you can never move the same data there. Yeah, that's just not going to work. Yeah, um, at the cluster, you see a similar sort of level. Yeah, um, the um, high performance bandwidth of, of not even the biggest clusters will, will be on the order of a petabyte per second. RAM bandwidth, 100 terabyte per second. The burst buffer cache, which belongs with this storage tier, is on the order of five times faster than the fastest file systems. Yeah, five terabytes a second for a reasonable cluster. And then we go down to the hundreds of gigabytes typically for the file systems. Now, the support software-wise for these uh, various tiers is actually quite different uh, from tier to tier, and I, I think there are quite a lot of obstructions in, in that going in the right, uh, converging to, to a really good solution. So the first tiers uh, close to the processor will be primarily used for computation, and so the data movement that you want to do at that level are perhaps pointers and to, to structures. And if the structures are used a lot, you want to promote them to faster memory and you want to demote them if they're not used a lot. Uh, you can do that at the level of pages, which is what the current uh, Intel computers offer, uh, the Intel chips offer to use the HBM in a, in a cache mode. Uh, but that may not be so optimal because a page is fairly large at this point. Yeah, moving 4K of data is, is quite a lot of data if you only need a few structures in it. Um, here, things begin to change because now you need to transition to not computation data, but something that, that is more like a file system. It's a runtime independent format of data. And the, the important aspect of that is that it will be reusable by different programs because things have a name. Yeah? If you plug in a flashcard in a computer, you will always see the directory tree, regardless of what system you have. 
you're unlikely to have that kind of luck if you take a random piece of memory. So there is a transition here from compute data to more reusable data, and a namespace is very important for that. Uh, I, I think that systems like HDF5 may be exactly fitting for, for, for the formats here. Um, and then uh, when you go further to the right in the direction of the file systems, maybe not so much will change. Yeah, it might become object stores, but uh, it, it, I don't think there will be a revolution going on there. Um, I, I thought that was a very short half hour, but um, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, now, the other very important thing we already looked at the bandwidth is that you need to write more and more for it to be efficient. On Flash, writing very small data pieces, like one page, is five times slower than writing larger pieces of data. So the granularity of data movement that you have on this side will need to become bigger and bigger and bigger. The consequence of that is that things must be put in containers. So you can have lots of small stuff happening here, but when you move the units of data from here to here, you need to move them as a group without looking inside at the, at the details. And these container concepts are very, very important. And, and Shifter has been mentioned as a good candidate for this in HPC. Uh, Shifter is a name of a, a container structure. Um, but these must become the building bricks of future storage architectures, yeah? And uh, that is not yet happening. People are still thinking about moving individual files up and down this hierarchy. So to summarize this, um, the tiering has migration of data, containers, and uh, reusable formats with names, yeah? And uh, persistence is a different question. So I think that NVRAM uh, is going to be by far the fastest storage system. And so any demanding application for storage that needs persistent, probably move it to NVRAM. Yeah, it will be much, much better anywhere else. But what other benefits does it really have for computing? Yeah, I, I'm not completely sure what the future meaning will be of NVRAM. Yeah, finally, its only difference is, is that it survives when the power goes off. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I think this is actually kind of a deep question, and uh, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, I know it's also a panel question, so I've already apologized for my very poor answer in uh, half an hour from now. Um, I think I should tell you a little bit about campaign storage. Uh, this is a concept introduced by Los Alamos that, um, again, adds tiers into the system. So, a traditional tier is uh, just a parallel file system and an archive. New tiers are burst buffers, campaign storage, and cloud. And the important thing to notice is that these primary tiers at the top offer very high bandwidth, but they cost a lot of money for capacity. So they're becoming smaller. As a result, the important thing is to move data in and out to cheaper storage. Yeah, and that is precisely what campaign storage does. Yeah, roughly its diagram is you have a few clusters, maybe with compute file systems like burst buffers, HDFS, Luster, or something, and you move this data in and out of campaign storage while the data is from time to time actively used. These buffers, for example, will only hold a few jobs. Yeah, that's not enough because a compute center may have 100 jobs uh, that are in a moderately active state. And that's where campaign storage comes in. Campaign storage has a file system interface. So it is, uh, it's not a new storage system or something like that. Um, and it focuses on parallel movement to the left and to the right. But we also built in features that are similar to the ones you find in archives. For example, can you search the data? Can you execute policies on it, like to find the files that you don't want? Um, and the way we did that is to add a search to uh, the ZFS file system. And this is not a complete database where you can search for anything. We have a histogram model. And so for example, we divide up the file sizes in five buckets. 
and the types of files in 10 buckets or something like that, access times in a few buckets, and then you get um, a little quantity that says, how many files and how many bytes do I have that have these properties? And we do that per subtree. You can maintain that very easily due to the uh, CFS changelog properties. It's not a new idea. It has been around for a long time. I've uh, been surprised that it hasn't been built into a lot of file systems. Yeah, at the moment, if you want to find out how many files there are in the subtree, you have to run find, and it will run for a long time, perhaps. Yeah. So the workflows that you can have with campaign storage are um, staging and destaging, which I already mentioned. You can do things like HSM by searching in the metadata. Um, there are uh, ways to migrate to cloud or make multi -copies of your, multiple copies of your archives. It's a, it's a fairly uh, general system. Um, we don't know yet how well it will latch on, uh, but it is quite differently constructed from the now very old systems that uh, have, have functioned as archives, and it probably matches the world of tiers quite well. Let's see. Um, the data layout uh, in campaign storage is very simple. Um, the uh, file system, of course, just has folders and files in, uh, in, in campaign storage. The directory data is in a file system, and then objects are used to store the data. One special property of the objects is, is that one object can contain very many small files. So this is this form of aggregation I talked about earlier. Yeah, you don't want to be writing small things when you're lower down in the, in the tiers when things are slower. When files are very large, they can be striped over multiple object repositories. Yeah, this is a fairly standard property, and uh, there's, there's not so much uh, surprising, not, not so many uh, surprises about it. So the data movers that we have today to go in and out are uh, LANL's parallel rsync, it's called PF tool. Um, we have a Lustre HSM mover, and what they do is packing small files and striping big ones. Yeah, what is coming are a few other ones, things like grid FTP and, and other HSM movers for DMAPI systems like uh, GPFS. The metadata layout, the most important thing that everybody is after here is again, bulk movement of metadata. Not lots of small files one at a time, but instead groups of metadata into the file system in and out because that will scale. So it's time to uh, wrap up here and uh, draw a few conclusions. So in this landscape, I, I think a lot of things have been resolved. There is a reasonably good understanding of HPC workloads. Yeah, this was not there 15 years ago. I think th th there is a, a lot of information about it now. There are beautiful libraries, HD5 and ADIOS, to support the infrastructure available to the uh, programmers. And there's good performance of low-level storage technologies, things like RAID drivers run at full speed, file systems can do, networks are good. But there are also many open questions. Yeah? Tiered storage is in its infancy. Yeah? We are beginning to see projects and experiments but there are certainly not yet um, a good choice. Like, is this one better than that, or is this a good principle? The transition from compute data to containerized data is something that needs a lot of attention. Yeah, I, I think it is, as I've explained, very important that the granularity of I.O. goes up as the tiers become slower. Um, Different ways of executing the workflows are needed, particularly, again, with the tiers, but also to fight systems that haven't worked very well, like integrate databases and that sort of thing. Um, identifying use cases for NVRAM. Yeah, I, I mentioned uh, that it's a bit of a puzzle what NVRAM is really good for. Yeah, um, I, I think it will be a wonderful storage system because of its speed, but you would think that it could do some new things. Um, Integrated, easily usable constructions will always be the driving thing for businesses, but also for users. Yeah, so I think that uh, that's my message for you about where we are with I.O. Thank you. Let's uh, thank our speaker.
I will take one question. So if you have a quick question. So there's one question here, and then we'll move on. And there will be, uh, Peter will also be on the panel. So. Um, so I'm not an I.O. expert, but having worked with accelerators and GPUs a lot, I've noticed a big trend. Can you? It's, could you say this one more time? The door was open, and there was a lot of noise. Oh, sorry. So I'm not an I.O. expert, but I've worked with accelerators and GPUs for a while. And I've noticed a big, a big trend is kind of across the board, people moving towards cache coherency and moving towards high bandwidth memory, whether it's on the GPU or Xeon Phi. Do you think there's a place for cache coherency on the like burst buffers, for example, moving between file system and burst buffer, between burst buffer and RAM? I think, first of all, this is a very good question. And the answer will be largely determined by the programming models that are available. Yeah, so in principle, you don't need coherency. A program can take care of it. In practice, coherency is very pleasant to have because then you don't have to program it. Yeah, in the cloud world, there is very little coherency and the work is going pretty well there. Yeah, and so I, I don't know where it will be heading. Yeah, it's, uh, but it's costly. I hope we can do better than that, yeah. So let's join me in thanking our speaker again.